Well, I've been around film and television now for over 30 years and I started off at Television New Zealand. I was not that long out of university, a year or two, and I had no great uh, desire to uh, have a, a career in this sector. I thought I'd go for a year or two and then disappear overseas and it uh, captured me very early. So I ended up spending 10 years at TVNZ. Um, started off as a what was um, called a, a program purchasing officer back then, which is, you know, very dry. And these days I'm sure they call them acquisitions executives, which sounds much more posh. Anyway, uh, contracting in the foreign programs is what that was. Um, and I had lots of opportunities there over 10 years. So um, I worked in a, in a range of program and production administration roles um, and ended up as head of commission programs um, 10 years later. That time was really interesting because it was um, the just bef uh, the period before the, the combined Office of Film and Literature Classification was created. So it was still doing just film, which was the best part of the job, no question. You were indeed paid to watch movies. Um, and it was great, it was great fun. It got me around the country to talk to people about classification issues and what the role of the government might or might not be around what you can and can't see. All good stuff. It's the only organisation of its type in the world, which is always fascinating. And it came out of the 1980s deregulation. Half the country was deregulated and most of the things it was doing, it wasn't just broadcasting. But the idea was that a single organisation or a single channel should not have its paws on all the money and should not have its paws on all the power when it came to uh, producing and commissioning content. So the, this is where the contestable system was born. Um, and back then, in 89, when New Zealand On Air started, I was still at Television New Zealand, but I remember absolutely the fights that went on at the time as the, the role settled down, because the system uh, is designed, if you like, like a three-legged stool. So we're, we're, all of us have some power and none of us have absolute power, and that's the key. So the broadcaster has the screen and a little bit of money, and theoretically not the idea, the producer has the idea and perhaps a little bit of money, but not enough and not the screen. And we have quite a lot of money, but no screen and a few ideas of our own. And when the three things work together well, we get a really good system where we have public funding being invested in a way that really does look out for minimal waste and for maximum focus on the audience. So the others have to worry about their businesses and their advertisers and all those things. New Zealand On Air sits there and says, which audiences should we be serving and how might we do that? And it's not just about television, of course. We're, we're the original multimedia agency, if you like, because we have um, significant activities, of course, in public radio, as we support Radio New Zealand, uh, in commercial radio in terms of music, uh, New Zealand music production itself, because we, we um, back songs and videos, considerable amounts of them, and community broadcasting, which is uh, access radio and regional television, um, and the Gatley digital media, which is, you know, the fun, innovative stuff. New Zealand On Air is an incredibly important organisation, and it's a, it's a great privilege to have this job. I mean, in effect, we've got a, a, a fairly large amount of money courtesy of the taxpayer, who may or may not agree with all of our funding decisions for a start. And our job is to, to secure a space for the local in a, in a sea of global content. So it's really easy, in, in television in particular, to, to buy and screen foreign content. It's already been made, it's already been funded, it's being sold at marginal cost, i.e. quite cheaply, and it's already been tested at its domestic market. So the only thing the broadcaster has to do is construct a really good schedule, promote it well, and their uh, financial risk is relatively small. It's quite the reverse in local, um, and we take this responsibility enormously seriously, and this is where our, you know, our beating hearts lie, because we want to see the very best New Zealand stories and songs on our screens and on our airways, and that's what gets us up in the morning. We've been around for 25 years, which is pretty amazing all by itself, really, given it's, a, it's still a unique model in the world. Um, all models have strengths and weaknesses. Um, the weaknesses of our model are, are relatively small, and that's to do, I think, with more the fragmentation of the audience and the platforms these days. It's quite hard to get scale anywhere. The strengths of the model are absolutely that the best ideas tend to bubble up to the top. There's a passionate and independent advocate uh, working with a driver that isn't just about bottom line profitability or worrying about how to pay the rent of your production house or those other things. 
we're here for range and diversity. So we're not going to do five things that are the same, and you might do if you're a broadcaster, if you think they're gonna work. Um, we're saying, where, where can we most uh, inject the most difference, I think? And sometimes we don't get that quite right, but mostly I think we absolutely do. And that's these days also because the production sector is um, lively, mature, has a scale itself, um, and hardly ever delivers, delivers us anything we're not proud of. New Zealand On Air's um, early major achievement, of course, was um, its support of Shortland Street, which in effect kicked off the um, local drama industry. Um, it, gave, it gave a kind of tentpole uh, a successful program after a, a year's settling down. Um, and, you know, the, the rest, as they say, is history. But that started a real renaissance in drama. Um, uh, it, hit, it, it hit a few wobbly patches in the 90s and then kicked off again and now, you know, it's, it's sensational. When I came back to New Zealand on air uh, in 2007, um, we looked hard at what drama was uh, being made then because it, it had hit a little bit of a, a wobbly patch, as it sometimes does. Um, Shortwood Street was still going strong. The, the series, the, the 13 part series were not doing so well for various reasons. Um, so we looked at that incredibly hard and said, let's give ourselves a decent goal for the next couple of years. Let's try and get three primetime successful 13 parters on the three main networks. And if you give yourself a big enough goal, it gives you really something to pitch for. Um, and it worked. Nobody was more surprised than us, but it worked. At that point, we had nothing trivial on one, we had Gurgles on two, and we had Outrageous Fortune on three. And it was because of the success of Outrageous Fortune first that enabled the other ones to happen, because it gives everybody courage once we see it start to work. When I started out on television um, last century, uh, there was virtually no independent sector at all. Uh, New Zealand On Air has been the catalyst for developing the independent television sector. There's no question about that. Um, and to see companies now striding across the world stage is just outstanding. Um, obviously the internet is changing the world as we speak uh, and nobody quite knows what that's going to mean but there's as many opportunities as there are challenges there and from a content perspective as opposed to an economic one, fantastic opportunities now to, to get to different audiences. The most recent um, challenge will be our 8 year funding freeze. Um, we're like most other um, state um, organisations, after the GFC, the lid was put on all expenditure for exactly the right reasons. But it's, it's been eight years since we have had additional funding from the government and it's now starting to bite. Weaknesses, I think, are still that we have yet to uh, work international co-productions well enough. Um, they're incredibly difficult. They, they're mostly camels, if you get them wrong, trying to serve two masters, neither of them very well. But it's absolutely an area we, we, we should be exploiting more, and um, producers need more and more opportunities, I think, to um, walk the international stage. Um, other than that, we're doing fine, I think. Um, as always, there's more ideas than there is money. Um, there's, a, there's a degree of... Um, conservatism now is still with the networks as they recover from the GFC. Um, I hope that changes and if it doesn't then we will find that we will look for um, online and digital outlets for the more innovative and experimental work I think because it's really important we continue to back them. That's the next stage of ideas. I really do think this is the best job in the country and it's a great privilege to have it. Um, we try hard to be the kind of, you know, quiet facilitators rather than the great tub thumpers. The tub thumping can be, you know, the people in front of the cameras and all the rest of it. But, but me and my team and my board are all, have, a, have a, a, almost a single-minded passion for this. You know, New Zealand, New Zealandness is what we're about and the airwaves of whatever description, including online, are, you know, are where people um, are most present most of the time at some point or another every day. So it's incredibly powerful stuff. And if it's left to a, a, a plethora um, of extremely well-regarded foreign content, that's fine, that's our global citizen stuff. But it's more and more important than ever before that there are sufficiently professionally produced, thoughtful and funny and provocative and interesting local content 
to balance out that mix. And we work our little asses off trying to make that happen.